Uh, so today we will be diving into the topic of AI in Africa, uh, which, uh, which is uh, for us uh, very important to tackle. And as we usually do at Bozar Lab, we have invited people from different uh, fields, the arts field, but also the science and the tech field. And this way, we really want to trigger uh, the discussions. Uh, sorry, <laughs> now you see me. Uh, we really want to trigger the discussions uh, by inviting people from different fields and by this transdisciplinary uh, discussions uh, we want to arrive to uh, out of the box thinking and uh, coming coming up with uh, original and uh, fascinating discussions uh, so before we start, I wanted to thank uh, our uh, main support here, which is uh, the STARTS program of the European Commission. STARTS stands for Science, Technology and Arts. Uh, and this uh, webinar is uh, in the framework of the STARTS talks. So the webinar will have different uh, moments. First, we will start with a keynote from Sedro Mensa, which is uh, about mapping AI in Africa. Uh, Sedro is a former cultural manager for arts and cultures of the South. Uh, but since 2015, he has uh, changed careers. And he is today an, uh, um, a consultant uh, for innovation uh, and uh, innovative strategies. Um, and he will be talking about uh, AI in Africa. Uh, then we will have the pleasure to show uh, uh, a screening of uh, the latest work by Mantia Diawara, who is a writer and filmmaker uh, born in, in Mali and who is uh, today a, a professor uh, at the New York University uh, uh, um, in comparative uh, literature and film. And uh, the discussion then following the screening will be uh, between uh, our other speakers here today with us. And I want to thank you for, for their presence. We have uh, Jennifer Quento. Hello, Jennifer, uh, who is the founder of Abuja Women in Machine Learning and Data Science, uh, which is a community of over a thousand members. She also co-organized uh, AI Saturdays Abuja, uh, which is another thriving artificial intelligence community in Nigeria. Uh, together with uh, Dia, uh, Dia Dia today, uh, we will be also discussing uh, these topics. Uh, and uh, Dia here is, is Associate uh, Director and Co-Founder of Aristarch Consulting. Uh, Dia Dia is a passionate entrepreneur in the digital and in the AI fields. She has a PhD in computer science and she is specialized in machine learning. Uh, she lives and works between Dakar and Abidjan. And finally, today, uh, we have also with us Imo, Imo de Medeiros, who is a Beninese and French uh, artist who works uh, uh, in, um, uh, in uh, some also transdisciplinary uh, practice. And she, he works on, on the fusion of material, the symbolic, but also the digital. He's very interested in the digital revolution um, and the different imaginaries that go uh, with uh, this topic. Um, so thank you uh, for being here today. We're absolutely thrilled. And now I will leave the floor to Sidro uh, for his keynote. And I will find you uh, at the end of this webinar. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, uh, Emma. Uh, nice to have you all here uh, today. Uh, thank you uh, for coming and thank you for the panelists. Uh, to, uh, to share the floor with me because I will need you, <laughs> definitely. Um, <clears throat> uh, I will uh, probably present my, do you see my, um, do you see my uh, screen now? Yes, we see your screen. Okay, so um, I will uh, try uh, because it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's something which is uh, pretty, uh, pretty difficult to do. I will try to, to map uh, uh, briefly in 10 minutes, uh, what, uh, how uh, the African AI uh, looks uh, in, uh, in Africa by mapping it in different regions and uh, according to different sectors. Uh, for the ones who are not familiar with, uh, with uh, uh, new technologies in Africa, uh, they assume that this kind of map is exactly what they would expect. So something which is blank with no, uh, with no access to new, new technologies, with few uh, strategies in place. Uh, here you see only Tunisia and Kenya 
seems to have, according to OECD uh, uh, AI strategy forthcoming, uh, which is of course not the case, but the criteria of ECD are slightly different, but I found this, uh, this map pretty uh, funny because it's actually corresponding with what we are actually thinking about AI in Africa. Uh, here we have a more detailed map uh, by, uh, by Oxford Insights. Uh, together with the ICDR, they uh, created, they create every year uh, AI readiness index uh, uh, to define actually the readiness and the preparedness for governments to, uh, to integrate AI in their strategies uh, when it comes to governance, when it comes to uh, to uh, education strategy, et cetera, et cetera. And here in the, you see that uh, some countries are emerging more clearly, uh, South Africa, uh, Kenya, Mauritius, that you don't see here on the map, but uh, actually Mauritius is the first uh, in this uh, ranking of uh, AI readiness for, Afri for the continent. Uh, you, have also, uh, you have also Senegal and Ghana, who are actually uh, leading. Uh, and then uh, just behind you have some countries like Rwanda or Nigeria, uh, and in some extent also Senegal. Um, there's some willingness uh, to develop, uh, uh, to develop uh, artificial intelligence and, and its use uh, in, uh, in, uh, in many governments, but uh, you have a lot of uh, structural weaknesses, which is not making that possible, as you can imagine. Um, um, so, um, and there's also the difficulty to, uh, to develop a 360 degree approach on AI because AI is something which is very confusing uh, for a lot and it encompasses so many aspects. It's so versatile uh, when it comes to regulation, uh, the relationship to culture, uh, the learning aspect, the economic aspect, and so on. Uh, you have one, um, one um, uh, alliance uh, created between 31 uh, different countries in Africa who's trying to think about how to uh, make the best use of new technologies and especially AI called Smart Africa Alliance. Um, you have also, of course, uh, in, uh, each, uh, in, in uh, many public universities in all of these countries, uh, you have uh, EI uh, uh, who, is, uh, who is actually uh, teach there. Of course, uh, you have also the support of the UN uh, because they are expert, uh, expert for, uh, for, uh, for new technologies and for the gover governments and especially ITU, so it's for telecommunication uh, and Global Pulse is a specialized uh, agency based in uh, Kampala, who is actually uh, quite intensively dealing with NLP uh, and, uh, and uh, new technologies. Uh, UNESCO is also in charge because you have to preserve the language and AI could help to preserve some so-called low resource languages from a market perspective, from a business perspective, but uh, we have uh, so many languages in Africa and it's very important to save them and preserve them and also to preserve intangible heritage. Um, and you have, uh, so you have uh, IRKAI, which is an institute for uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, created by, by UNESCO. And you have also, um, also uh, Emerging Technologies, uh, an agency uh, for, uh, um, on behalf of uh, UNESCO working based in France in, in Bordeaux. Of course, you have other UN organizations who are very actively either using or promoting the use of AI. Uh, one of them is World Bank, uh, who is actually uh, using that in order to, for example, uh, uh, facilitate transfer or uh, enable to also to uh, better uh, organize remittances uh, towards productive, uh, productive investment from the diaspora. You have UNFPA who is also um, trying to using it uh, to also to know a bit better about the behavior of, of the people um, they, are, they, are, they are watching over. And there are also uh, a lot of innovation funds uh, depending on this UN agencies like the one of UNICEF uh, who's also using uh, this new technology 
technologies and also encouraging the government to use them. But the mainstreaming of this kind of innovation is a half, a hard path. And when, when we're talking about uh, artificial intelligence, we think of US, we think about big companies, the GAFAM, Google, Amazon, Facebook, uh, Apple and Microsoft. Microsoft being the smallest one, and here you have a, a map of uh, Microsoft invo involvement in, in Africa. We form uh, innovation centers in Tunisia, Uganda, Botswana, and Tanzania. You have also a new African research institute who opened uh, in uh, Nairobi uh, last year. And one will be open, and uh, you can confirm, Jennifer, uh, in Nigeria uh, should be open this year. But uh, out of the GAFAM, even if uh, Microsoft is the smallest one, he is the one who has the, the biggest involvement uh, when it comes to AI uh, in the term of presence in Africa. But uh, the other, like Google, is also uh, present. Um, they established in 2018, I think, Google AI. Uh, we have to say it's very small. Right? It's, uh, at the time in 2018, it was only seven people working at Google AI. It's not so huge as we could expect. Um, we have also uh, the sponsoring uh, so of uh, Facebook of, and Google of uh, different kind of events and training and learning session, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, Facebook is currently con constructing uh, 730,000 kilometers of underwater internet cable which is not uh, insignificant, but the presence of the US for AI practitioners is actually through uh, the tools that they are providing uh, for, uh, for, uh, for machine learning or for, for deep learning, as well as the cloud computing, because you have to store the uh, data. We didn't talk about Amazon, but Amazon is actually um, uh, very talented at uh, selling also uh, this kind of product. Uh, in the US, we shouldn't forget also that uh, uh, beyond the GAFAM, you have also uh, NVIDIA and IBM. IBM is present on the continent for a long time and is providing assistance and sponsoring the same, and which is in interesting for NVIDIA. Uh, and it's also the same for, for the others is that they are promoting a former uh, manager to work and to develop their own structures um, in Africa. So re repatriates who are actually uh, creating uh, new structures like Alli Alliance for Africa, um, the former, the, the, um, uh, the, the current uh, founder is actually a former uh, manager and Vidya, for example. Um, uh, when we are talking about uh, foreign influences, we are also thinking about China. And here you have like the, the Chinese character for AI, looks very similar uh, to, uh, to AI, but means something completely different because uh, the first characters mean men and the other one mean works. So it's a work by men. It's, it's a completely uh, different understanding of what AI is. And it's exactly what we are trying to grasp today. So you can have different definition of AI and you can use them and export them potentially. It's actually the idea that the machine is here to uh, replace the human so that the labor, what is, uh, like what is difficult for the human will be uh, delegated to the machine. So it's a almost Marxist uh, kind of influence. Uh, and nevertheless, uh, the private companies are very active, uh, unlike uh, uh, the, co the, the big uh, corporates in, uh, uh, in tech companies uh, in the US, uh, they are not mission driven, they are really market driven. Uh, the idea is really to develop products who, are, uh, who will be sold. So they try to valorize the current uh, state of the art in terms of AI and uh, the narrow AI that we have today with very specific task is, uh, is, uh, is very useful and you can already uh, make business out of it. Interest, uh, what is interesting in this regard is the fact that, uh, for example, Transition, who is actually the main um, uh, appliance, so uh, smartphone appliance uh, seller in, uh, in Africa, uh, is act, uh, and, uh, under the brand uh, uh, Techno, 
for example, is uh, integrating an AI who is able to calibrate uh, the, the, the computer, the, the photography for dark skins. So you don't have the, the problem of bias that you could encounter in other countries where black skins are a minority. So here you are just trying to focus on, on your market and your market is major, uh, in majority black. So you design products and you design the algorithm accordingly. Um, another uh, aspect which is very important is of course like the influence of the state. Uh, we know that the, the state want uh, to create leverage by creating leadership, uh, technological leadership, and my influence AI governance in, uh, in some African countries. So that's one of the risks that we have currently. Um, they're equipping uh, uh, hard, uh, mostly with hardware, like I mentioned, uh, smartphones, but also all server equipment, et cetera, et cetera, will be actually provided by uh, Chinese companies, uh, Huawei as first. And when it comes to events in, in, in initiatives, you have quite a lot. Here I selected a map for Africa Tech Up Tour, uh, which is actually a series of, uh, of uh, workshops and, uh, and uh, competition uh, to develop an AI project, including also this, uh, its uh, business uh, component. It's taking place in Francophone countries, so it's worth to note. Uh, you have also Living Labs, uh, who is working much more based on open innovation and uh, really uh, try to tackle uh, real, um, real world uh, challenges. Uh, Deep Learning Indaba is actually the most famous one. Uh, they have already developed 27 chapters uh, in the world continent and they are uh, doing the sixth edition in Tunisia this year. Uh, Zindi is also very active uh, by uh, trying to organize hackathon and competition uh, for data scientists. And Dimil Coder is, uh, is an organization who is trying to, uh, to train uh, the future of, uh, of uh, African coders and programmers with also a focus on AI uh, and uh, organized by the diaspora. And you have the Africa AI Expo, which is the biggest event when it comes to AI in Africa. It's not about uh, learning or exchanging, it's much more about business. And, but you have also digital art events with a focus on AI. It's not always the case, but uh, they try to uh, focus every year uh, a bit on, on AI. Uh, Fakugezi uh, in, uh, in South Africa, uh, led by uh, Tegan uh, Bristow, who I think is attending uh, this uh, webinar, and Afropixel Afro in Senegal, who is receiving the support from the uh, foreign ministry uh, uh, in Belgium. Um, you have, uh, we should um, also mention some other initiatives on AI, like AFRIA, Agence Francophone pour l'Intelligence Artificielle, uh, which is badly needed because actually there's a gap between Francophone and English speaking countries when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence. Alliance for AI based, um, based in uh, South Africa, I think, which is actually federating a lot of organization, but not the Francophone one. Uh, AI for D, AI for development, who is funded by, uh, among others, by the Swedish government and by also the Canadian, I think. And uh, DSA, uh, Data Science Africa, with a very active branch in Nigeria, uh, Data Science Nigeria. Um, they want to, uh, to, to, to train, uh, they have uh, this ambitious goal of training 1 million uh, IA talents. It might sound ambitious, but I don't think it is. Uh, you will see a bit later. Um, and you have a mix of initiative coming from the grassroots, coming from uh, foreign uh, countries uh, or from initiated by the diaspora themselves. And uh, they are also very modern, dynamic. Uh, they are, uh, uh, they are uh, online, but they are also uh, in presential in a mix and it, it works, it's working pretty well. Um, the startup here, here you have like a, a, a map from GSMA who is actually showing the number of uh, AI uh, use case in, uh, in the report that they produced, uh, not only around Africa, but also uh, Asia. 
Um, what you have to know about the, the startups compared to, uh, to, uh, uh, to other communities is that they are uh, driven by a market pool approach. So they are bringing actually, they try to be as user-centered as possible. They try to tackle real world challenges, which is also one characteristic when it comes to Africa. It's we want to solve real problems. And they want to uh, turn uh, challenge into, into opportunities because we are lacking of data, for example, we're really lacking of some aspect uh, who are uh, maybe available in more developed countries or in Silicon Valley. So here you have new solutions to, to develop. And uh, the majority, as you see, is in English speaking countries. Doesn't mean that it doesn't exist in, uh, in Francophone countries, but there's no awareness and uh, uh, there's no feeling that you have to communicate. Uh, and uh, there's also a, a barrier of uh, language. And here you have like a more detailed maps. Here you can see the different uh, kind of functionality on the right side. You have data, uh, data analytics. You have also uh, conversational, conversational AI with a chatbot that you know you have also used in agriculture, in med tech, et cetera, et cetera. Here you have a number of uh, 75 ventures. There's actually much more. Uh, this uh, map, a very good map from Britter Bridges uh, was produced in 2029. I think at least it uh, it doubled in the in the meanwhile in these very countries, and you have to quadruple, quadruple probably if you're integrating all the other countries. And uh, we are growing in numbers uh, when we when it comes to communities. The communities are more techno push, so they they are really trying to rely on the technology first, but still uh, they have this interest to develop that for the communities. Uh, and to tackle also the real world challenge like the, the startup wants to do. We have a strong sense of ethics. Maybe we will discuss that with Jennifer later on. Uh, they are fiercely independent, uh, even for their using tools uh, from Google or uh, storing uh, data or using cloud computing from, from, uh, from the GAFA. And they are learning themselves uh, very often. And uh, worth to mention is Google de developer groups. Uh, you have 150 groups in, uh, on the continent with an average of 500 uh, members uh, for each. Uh, and so that's about the same number of figures when, when it comes to uh, uh, Facebook developer groups. Uh, you have also a community that I admire a lot, uh, Masakane, who is working on NLP on these uh, local languages. Uh, Jennifer is also a member of Masakane, so she will probably talk a bit more about it. And uh, we talk about uh, women in machine learning and data science uh, continentally, but uh, they're also very active in, in Nigeria. And uh, uh, Data Science Nigeria is also very active and data rules with international funding, which is very interesting. But you have also other communities like the community of the diaspora, uh, uh, worth to mention is Black, Black in AI, who is very active also when it comes to ethics. Uh, the, the founder of uh, Google AI was uh, uh, fired from the, from the, uh, from the board, uh, the ethics board of, uh, of uh, Google recently, uh, which was quite uh, shocking. And, uh, but uh, maybe there's a reason, it's probably that that's, uh, there's something more radical to, to develop uh, when it comes to AI and to have something which is not only respectful, but on, only to change the center of AI somewhere else. Uh, the diaspora is more, uh, has studied more, like, uh, like has degrees and most of them are scholars. Uh, most of them are actually working in, uh, in companies, but unlike American companies, when it comes to Europe, they are not valorized for what, from where they're coming from and what they could bring actually uh, in terms of diversity. And they are scattered, they're not really united, but they initiated a lot, uh, like 10,000 10, coders I mentioned earlier and other projects. And uh, they have, uh, when, they are, when they are creating startups, where they have, the connection to uh, investment uh, in the Western countries, uh, and they are able to, uh, to create uh, brilliant companies uh, like Instadeep uh, from uh, Karim Begir, 
or, uh, or memes uh, in Canada, uh, which, which are champions in terms of uh, deep tech innovation currently. So where is Europe? Because uh, it's a start talk uh, when it comes to Europe. So that's a question that we, are, we will ask also uh, at, by the end of the discussion. Uh, there's a lot of uh, European companies who are trying to actually engage the African markets. Uh, Sometimes also in joint ventures, trying also to work with, uh, with local companies. You have uh, corporation agencies but they're working on a national level. You don't have really a European approach uh, when it comes to uh, AI in Africa. Yeah. So we have, uh, we have uh, the, the, the Swedish uh, uh, corporation agencies, you have a program Fair Forward uh, uh, led by JZ, uh, GIZ in, uh, in Germany. And you have all in, uh, every, in every country, you have uh, your, uh, your own strategy that you develop uh, uh, on your side. Um, the European Commission was the one who initiated the development of uh, living labs um, that I mentioned earlier, but there's not much more than that. Uh, and you have like, uh, you don't have the giants like, uh, like in, the, in the US, but you have uh, big companies like Atos who are underrepresented compared to, uh, to the GAFAM, for example. And you have small initiative from Ericsson, for example, or Siemens. Uh, so, and uh, yesterday, uh, I guess you heard about um, the uh, regulation uh, of AI in Europe. Like the question is to, uh, to understand, okay, what is actually the discussion engaged with, with other countries, with other emerging countries, who have uh, like their own understanding, so maybe value to bring uh, to Europe, uh, like Africa. So is there room, any room for discussion? And is there a possibility of cooperation uh, with something different than only development institute, but maybe center of excellence, because you have a lot of uh, research and development institutes in Europe. They are brilliant. And it's possible probably to try to develop cooperation and exchange at this level and not uh, bring that under the paradigm of, of development. You are not talking about development when, when you are uh, working with uh, Russia or with uh, any other country of another fair. So why should it be the case for, for Europe? So that's, that's, uh, that's it for me for my uh, very long introduction. I, I hope I wasn't too long. Um, we will uh, uh, quickly move to uh, the next um, the next part of, uh, of our webinar uh, with, uh, with a video, uh, the excerpt of a, a movie, the documentary movie that Mathieu um is currently uh, shooting. It's a, uh, it's a film in progress. So you have the opportunity in uh, Avant Premiere uh, to see uh, an excerpt of, he, of his movie. Knowledge is something that, uh, even if you take one family, you take two sisters, one will have it and one will not have it. Yeah, I'm searching for a for the difference between uh, science uh, knowledge mm -hmm. and this knowledge. I'm a bit searching for that, and science knowledge is, of course, mm -hmm. uh, at least pretending to be as public as possible. I mean, mm -hmm. there are many caveats in that, but nevertheless, the idea is that you bring it out. While here, uh, it is 
quite the opposite, it seems at least. So it seems. Mm -hmm. So my question is then really like, uh, is there a necessity not to be that uh, public? Il y a une sorte de nécessité dans la mesure où euh, euh, il, il faut il faut se dévouer pour le savoir, pour la pour le pour la connaissance. Et donc ça, tout le monde ne, ne le fait pas. Ça dépend aussi des raps qu'on a, des esprits qu'on qu qu a. Et euh, euh, je me demande si dans notre société, c'est pas un peu la même chose quand même, parce que les, les gens qui savent, quand bien même ils seraient professeurs, etc., souvent ils cachent leur savoir sous un jargon hyper spécialisé, où les gens perdent de pied très rapidement. Et c'est la question même de l'intelligence artificielle, parce que est-ce qu'on peut raisonnablement imaginer que chaque citoyen peut contrôler ce qu'il y a dans les algorithmes qui sont à la base euh, des, des dispositifs euh, confiés à une intelligence artificielle Ce serait démocratiquement souhaitable, mais est-ce que c'est possible C'est plutôt une question que je vous poserai à vous. Fantastic, very impressive. Uh, um, I have to say, it's not the first time I'm, I'm watching the, this excerpt, but uh, I got goosebumps uh, every time I, I'm watching it. Um, Mancha Diawara, you uh, you are a filmmaker, uh, and you wanted to uh, to make something, uh, to produce something, and uh, to create a thinking about about artificial intelligence. And for some people, it might be a bit remote to the topic, uh, even though we saw in the second part of the video, uh, what is the, what may be the relationship you see. Um, the, the question I have is regarding what we've saw, uh, what we've seen, so that the dub ritual is uh, actually practiced by uh, Lebu uh, and priestress, like the old priestess you see dancing uh, with, uh, with um, uh, buckets on, on her head uh, is actually a div divination ritual, highly coded. And uh, I wanted to know because you, it seems in this uh, in this video where where you are actually filmed, uh, it that you are an outsider. You are you don't understand what you see, or is it uh, just like challenging? What you what you think what you're thinking is it right? Could you maybe describe a bit more about the, the word that you used uh, yourself when describing uh, your your feeling uh, as an outsider? What does it mean, outsider? Are you not African? Thank you, first of all, Sejiro Mensa, for this elaborate uh, presentation of the situation, the map of. Uh, AI in Africa. It, it was great. I really enjoyed it. I, by outsider, I'm referring to two things. I'm, I'm an outsider on the one hand to AI and an outsider to this very complex ritual uh, called the Ndup uh, that you find in Senegal, that you can also find uh, variation in Haiti. You can find it in Benin, you can find it in Mali, you could find it all over Africa. But so I'm an outsider. I think the important thing about that is that if you also consider modernity, enlightenment, the way it came to Africa, it came to Africa first to civilize Africans. But this came through as a way of destroying, eliminating their cultures eliminating their languages, eliminating their literatures and replacing them with European and now Chinese and now American and so on. So this, many of these rituals have retreat, retreated in places. Uh, in Senegal, this is in a, a place called uh, Tuwab Jala, which is a tourist town, but if you just walk maybe uh, two kilometers away, this is taking place and has not been taking place very often. Uh, when we did it, you could see all the children. They had heard about this, but they have not seen it. 
So they were even more excited than we were. So I'm an outsider in that sense. I'm an outsider, a, a man from Mali who's Muslim, uh, who's also Western educated. So I have become an outsider to myself, if there is such a thing as, as a self. And I think I will ask the same question then to uh, uh, maybe to, uh, to first uh, DA, uh, if you are here, uh, because you're, you're from Senegal, actually, you're living in Dakar. Uh, you, you got also this Western education, but uh, you, you spent uh, a lot of time in, in Senegal, of course, and you are now currently living and based there. Um, how does it resonate in some way, some manners, uh, maybe with your, or actually your, your career, because you're, you're, you're consulting, uh, you're providing some consultancy for, for companies on, uh, among others, the, the best use of AI uh, in, their, in their services. So, um, and you also, uh, you have also, uh, 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 you, you actually an engineer, so you are used to deal with uh, data. Uh, uh, we have two types, two type of data when we are talking about artificial intelligence. You have like the structured data, the one that actually are able to recognize to be recognized easily, uh, like one zero one zero one zero, and then you have like the the unstructured data. Uh, which is bringing to deep learning. So you have ma machine learning for the structured data and uh, for the unstructured data uh, machine learning. And I, of course, I'm, I'm playing with words, uh, unstructured data. Uh, how familiar do you, are, are you with these kind of rituals? Not, not that uh, you've seen them, but how does it resonate to you um, taking place a few kilometers from where you are actually living? Uh, thank you, Cedro, for uh, your, your presentation. Um, indeed, in this video, we can see a session of what is called in Wolof, Lundup. Wolof is one of the national language of Senegal, and these ceremonies are practiced in the Lebu communities who are generally fishermen, who mostly live in Dakar, and uh, the Lebu community has a strong belief that it is protected by mystical forces, and the offering that we can see in the video, the goats are a means of regaining the protection of these mystical forces when there is a misfortunes, for example. Uh, I think it is a beautiful video that show without any artifice, a uh, very rich and resilient tradition and culture. This practice has existed in Lebu community for millennia Today, you go to Yof uh, in, in Dakar, you can attend a NUP ceremony. The Lebu have managed to preserve this practice and they are flourishing in their culture. Uh, I think culture in a way is part of the identity of individual of the community. And personally, I am Cartesian, but uh, having growing up in Senegal and having relative close to the Lebu community, I watch this video with a lot of kindness. Uh, there are, of course, quite a few things in this practice that I don't understand uh, and that I haven't tried to understand either. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, I will uh, ask the same question to Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, you're based in Nigeria, in Abuja. And you used to work with, uh, with communities like uh, house of farmers uh, to, uh, to have machine translation uh, from Hausa to another language, maybe also to another local language like Igbo. And, and you are in, in a big city, Abuja is, is a huge and yeah, wonderful city. Um, how do you relate to this ritual this performance and the codes uh, that that we can we can also distinguish even if we we are not necessarily able to understand yeah okay so um to this um particular video this particular um community right so i am a little bit of an outsider 
but an, also an insider. Because um, one thing with language is language reflects the people, right? So if I'm working on the machine translation um, model to translate from one low resource language to another low resource language, I have to understand the people that owns the language, right? Where is the history behind this language? Where did it come from? How did you start speaking this way? And one beautiful thing with language is there are several variations of the same language. So for example, there are different variations of AUSA, there are different variations of Igbo languages and all. And if you have to translate to bring several communities together, right? You also have to understand them. And they have cultures, they have, um, they have things that they do that is also embedded even in the language that they speak. Yeah. And there's a there's a whole complexity in the language beyond the the structure of verbal language. Exactly. Is, is what you mean. Exactly. Yeah. It it reminds me of of the case of uh, Melissa Alela, uh, who is combining NLP with uh, virtual reality in order to uh, recreate the, the experience of story of African storytelling, including mm -hmm. the interaction with, uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with the audience, who is not only a passive audience, but also able to interact with it. And also uh, integrating the gestures and, and all, all other aspects like the mimics, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which is enabled, for example, with uh, artificial intelligence through sentiment analysis. And um, um, maybe it's, uh, it led very well to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to our last panelist, uh, Emo de Medeiros, um, who was uh, uh, introduced before, uh, earlier by, by Emma. Um, Emma and Emo. Uh, Emo is actually uh, a name uh, given by, by uh, Voodoo Priester. So it's a, na a name given for people who are initiated. So how uh, you from Benin see, so uh, perceives uh, these kind of, of uh, complex rituals, how do you uh, interpret that? Um, hello, first of all, thanks for inviting me and thanks uh, Sadro for the great presentation about AI. Um, I wouldn't dare interpret it. You know, um, in Benin, uh, we have, I mean, I've seen and um, experienced uh, from a family um, perspective, uh, similar rituals. They are multi-layered really. Um, so there is uh, what the ritual is supposed to, uh, to, to do or to celebrate or to um, the effects it's supposed to have on reality and the spiritual, in the spiritual dimension. And there are occult meanings from people who are initiated. So I wouldn't, you know, even start to imagine what's the meaning of, of the ritual. But of course, what I see are um, commonalities uh, from the with the rituals uh, that we have, um, you know, in the South of Benin. Because I, I don't know any ritual from North of Benin. Even Benin uh, is, uh, you know, there is not such a guy. As the, way, the same way there is no such thing as Africa, you cannot say a single sentence that would be valid in all the countries of Africa, even the smallest <laughs> Benin. What is true from the South is not true for the North. So, I mean, in terms of what it evokes to me, it's, um, it's, it's similar in the structure, um, the, the, you know, the community gathering around the ritual, you know, different generations intervening in it. Uh, and, but, but the overall, overall meaning I guess is indecipherable and indecipherable. Well, it's a complicated word to pronounce for a non uh, native speaker uh, for me. So, um, but but what, I, what 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 interests me is um, the the idea that um, in the same way, you know, that AI helps decrypt um, things that are not obvious. Um, in the same way, I think these uh, ceremonies um, that are understood in a certain way today, and in which uh, uh, Diego thinks she was a Cartesian, which is uh, which I am to some extent too. I guess one part of it is explainable in terms of uh, you know tradition, 
But maybe one part of it, which touches the spiritual, will be explained maybe through AI one day and the efficiency of, of those uh, practices in, in, in reality, in maybe in different logic than the purely Cartesian logic will appear and be sort of a, not explained, but described more adequately in the future. That's a, that's a very good transition because I actually, um, I, I was uh, I, I read uh, 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 the book of a uh, uh, famous uh, so in the meanwhile famous uh, ethno mathematician uh, called Ron Eglash. Uh, Ron Eglash is also a cybernetician, so we are talking about cyborgs and we are talking about uh, interaction with the machine. And um, he visited uh, a, a priester uh, in Dakar. Um, uh, and uh, he attended uh, several days of ritual uh, from the from this priest of the Bambara uh, com community. So it's not it's not the the, the Lebu or the Wolof uh, community. Uh, so that's that's the only difference, more or less. You have also sacrifice. Uh, you have also uh, several days of performance. And actually, uh, it's a sound divination. So you you have you you create marks with your fingers uh, to uh, to uh, to proceed and and uh, to uh, to make your job as a priester. And uh, I will read a, a short uh, excerpt of his uh, of his uh, this description in his book uh, African Fractals. Um, the use of an iterative loop passing outputs uh, of an operation back as, as inputs for the next stage was a shock to me. I was at least as taken aback by the sound symbols as the divinos had been by the counter set. So he's describing actually uh, how uh, uh, it was really something very foreign to talk about mathematic, like counter set is actually uh, uh, a mathematic uh, formula, which is very foreign for, for the priest there. But here in this case, he was shocked because actually he noticed the, and I, I quote, the mutual delight in two recursion fanatics discovering each other. Meaning that actually what he, what he has seen is something that he completely understood from his mathematician perspective, uh, from uh, uh, an algorithmic perspective, because we are talking at this very moment from an algorithm, the uh, input and output generated is actually uh, a, a formula, which is actually uh, 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 based to uh, base to system, which is actually producing uh, outputs who are always different, somehow um, chaotic, because you cannot never predict what's happening. And in artificial intelligence, it's about a lot about uh, predictive analysis. Uh, so he's an insider, I would say. He's coming from the US. It was the first time he was in, in, uh, on the continent. Uh, uh, back at the time, and he was an insider. So uh, the question is, is uh, probably we are talking about different kind of things, but it's exactly the same. We are talking just from a different perspective, the perspective of a practitioner of mathematics uh, and the perspective from a, an abstract perspective. Uh, around mathematics and around algorithm. And uh, is it not possible, and I will uh, ask immediately to Emo uh, to, to reply, is it not possible to, to see uh, something which is actually creating um, in this uh, chaos some rules so that uh, it's easier to deal with, uh, with uh, something which is beyond us? Um, you mean using artificial intelligence? I'm not sure I understood the question well. Would you mind repeating it, please? Okay. I, I, what I meant is uh, the fact that 
we are talking about two mathematicians uh, talking uh, the same language. And uh, we have one insider uh, uh, coming from the US and a scientist uh, who see actually uh, the connection. Ah, sorry, do you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's a, a deep connection between this uh, practitioner uh, of mathematics and this scientist of, uh, of mathematics. And is there not a possibility to, uh, to uh, apprehend artificial intelligence um, the same way that this practitioner is doing, which is actually uh, a lively access to the machine, to what is beyond us, to what we don't understand. Mm, okay. <clears throat> I don't know any, I think, I think the, the whole talk about uh, artificial intelligence to me is uh, kind of interesting because it's, I think it sort of refers um, every bit as something that is a fantasy and that we fantasize as something that is actually used. I mean, the real effect, I mean, it's, it's much sexier to talk about artificial intelligence than machine learning, for instance. But at the basis of what's called artificial intelligence is machine learning. And machine learning should be to some extent demystified too. It has to do with uh, the capacity for networks to treat extremely large uh, amounts of information extremely fast, much faster than before. So the idea of machine learning for, I mean, of course, I'm not talking for anyone who's here, but rather for the audience is, the idea of, uh, it's similar to uh, uh, learning. I mean, it's, in, it's similar to human learning in, in so, uh, to human learning in so far as it's more based on what would be the equivalent of uh, human experience, meaning, uh, let's say I want to, um, I mean, to learn about, I don't know, uh, uh, whatever um, topic, uh, I will just expose myself to a lot of material regarding this topic, whether it be art, whether it be science, whether, um, and, and the way I'm going to take it in is not in the way of a traditional computer. It's going to be in a way where, let's say I want to know about, I don't know, uh, painting for instance, and I'm going to watch thousands of paintings from, from very different periods. And that's the way uh, machine learning works, meaning uh, about inducing instead of deducing and having a machine be told exactly where to look. So sort uh, little by little, it's sort of uh, from indication, from human indication, it, it sort of refines what's going to find. I think the best example is um, uh, medical. I mean, one of the best examples, medical example is being used a lot in Israel, for instance. I've been, I've been talking with a researcher working in Israel and the, he was telling me about this spectacular evolution in, uh, of artificial intelligence because he he was interested in, in uh, he was working with uh, doctors who were working on prostate cancer. And so what he was telling me was regarding the improvement of the artificial intelligence. That's what very uh, fascinating about it, that he said over the cost of uh, the course of one year, uh, the artificial intelligence, so the best doctors, uh, the specialists of prostate cancer, uh, can from scans and x-rays uh, determine the presence of you know, cancerous cells uh, in analysis in approximately, I mean, the, the very best, around 80, 96%. And when the artificial intelligence, I mean, the program uh, started you know, treating the information, it went from around 70% recognition of, uh, from the images, I mean, from the same material that it was uh, submitted to, their, to the human doctors, to 98% recognition of uh, the, the prostate cancer. What was interesting to me is, so the, the, actually the machine became more, ad, I mean, more capable of detecting early cancer than, than, than humans, however, there were a certain number of cases where something like intuition were into, was intervening or this capacity of the human mind to zoom and de-zoom and sort of having like, a, I would say, a intuition based patterns that, that were allowing the doctors to detect some of the 
uh, uh, you know, in the images on the cancer cell that the machine was not detecting. So basically the, the, the overall number of the machine, machine was better, but in some instances, the human were, were still uh, better than the machine as uh, uh, detecting a certain number of things. So in, in general, yes, I mean, um, um, what, is, uh, what is happening is to, to me, I mean, uh, the way I feel it is we have more and more interventions um, I mean, like the vaccines, no, the, the, the current, in the current crisis without artificial intelligence, there would be no vaccines in such a little time. Uh, I mean, without the uh, capabilities of treatment uh, and, and in, the, in the modes of, of treatment of, the informa of information that's happening now, there would be no such thing as a vaccine. So uh, I guess, yes, it's, uh, I see it as a tool, as a very elaborate tool, but, but at, the, in the same, at the same time, uh, what is fundamentally different from, 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 you know, before is this sort of inducing, inductive way of, of appreciating things. So I think it still remains a tool. And even though, you know, it's been uh, very, a very, uh, you know, um, it's one of the really buzzwords and, you know, like uh, concepts on, on which uh, people, you know, uh, uh, think a lot and produce a lot of, of literature. I guess it, it remains something that that has to be. Uh, it's for, so far autonomous uh, artificial intelligences and multi-field artificial intelligences are still a fantasy. So I guess yes, it's a fantastic tool to analyze large amounts of data to find path and comparisons. You know that a human wouldn't be because the, 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 the treating of this kind of information would be impossible. But then again, you know, it's, it's mm. what you use it for. We haven't reached the, 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 I mean, no artificial intelligence, for instance, can today pass Turing's test. Turing's test, once again, yeah. not for the other panelists, but uh, for the audience. It, definitely. It's, so it's, it's clearly, so we are not talking about uh, an artificial intelligence who is able to do uh, a lot uh, is to do is able to do very specific uh, task uh, when it's given. And it's a matter of configuration. I, I will ask probably a last question to the practitioners um, before we are giving a bit time for the question from the audience because uh, actually time flies. I didn't notice. So sorry for that, um, Jennifer. Um, you are a member of Masakane, I, I, I told before, and uh, I, I'm very impressed by, by the visions and by the ethics that Masakane uh, has when it comes to uh, engage data uh, without having too much data, but uh, trying to accept all kinds of, of data sets, but at the same time also to have a fair use of the data who are, uh, who are uh, uh, proposed. Uh, and I have a, another um, quote from uh, René Glash. He's talking about the function of African facts of, of African fractals. Is actually this this uh, pattern that he identified was very developed in uh, in Africa, and he's saying that their function is egalitarian at the core of, of how they are formed and performed. So with the shape, the geometry of a fractal and performed like the performance that we have seen before. Um, that this uh, function is an emphasis on social organizing rather than material culture. So this uh, aspect uh, of, equali uh, of uh, equalitarian, this aspiration of trying to serve the community uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, try to tackle real problem challenges, but always in a, in a fair manner. Is it something which is by design when we're talking about AI ethics? Uh, because actually what Masakane is showing when, it, when they're talking about uh, AI ethics is, is a lot something which is really deeply embedded in the very thinking, and uh, and according to Ronnie Glash, Ronnie Glash, it's also the way the algorithm uh, design uh, def who is designing the fractal, who is also in the design 
something which is made to be equalitarian and with a social purpose uh, on, on, on the first place. Okay, so in terms of communities, right? And I've been very privileged to um, see communities grow from one to thousands of members, right? Um, be it Masakani, uh, Women in Machine Learning, Data Science, AI Saturdays, different communities that we have in Nigeria, right? And there's one major thing that we are always very critical on and is AI ethics. If it's unethical, do not build it. Because one major thing for us too is we believe we are building AI by Africans for Africa. We're building solutions that are um, solving our own unique problems, not necessarily solutions that solve problems in the West and about our own unique problems first, then scale it globally, right? If it works here in Nigeria, if it works in Ghana, most likely it might work in other Western countries. But we believe in solving problems, our own unique problems, and ethics is very core. Cool. So why waste money and resources building things that are unethical when you can use that same energy to um, do things that serve mankind, that serve, um, do things that serve mankind. And also in terms of social, which is um, another thing that I, I think is embedded in the fabric of Africans. We are very social people. In almost every country you can visit in Africa, we are very huge social people, right? Um, Nigerians are, they, they call them party people, right? You see the big Nigerian weddings, the big Nigerian festivals and all those things. And you see that same DNA, even in the way we build our AI communities, right? We're very social. Like the video that we just watched, the festival started, it looks like I see we started early in the morning and went through down, even down to midnight or to the evening. Same thing happened in our communities. Sometimes we have um, classes from uh, morning to night and nobody wants to go home, <laughs> right? So we have, so we always built that bond, that um, social beings and we learn together. We, it's, it's Ubuntu, let me put it that way, right? We, we learn together, we grow together. And another thing also for us as a community is, um, Nigeria, let me just talk about Nigeria since I live in Nigeria. Nigeria is the largest, um, in terms of population, largest country in Africa, right? And also it's made up of over 70% young population. So population could be a bad thing and also a good thing. If we have this huge population of people that are young, vibrant and eager to learn, that means in terms of talent, Nigeria is a very good fit for AI, right? And also that's why we keep building these communities and we have restraints. We have restraints to funding, to infrastructure. And the only way we could push ahead is if we all do it together. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, I like the fact that actually, uh, maybe that's uh, just an idea for me, but it's mm -hmm. somehow transpiring in, uh, in uh, the work that uh, African scientists are producing when they are uh, designing functionalities uh, using AI, something which is benevolent, something which is lively uh, in, this, in the very algorithm and yeah. uh, some, something which is also very strict when it comes to protection of, of the information who is actually transmitted at, at the very moment, who is given to feed the machine. We were talking a lot about data because uh, data is, is a major aspect when it comes to AI. There's this obsession of data, data, data. But at the end, so we are coming when talking about an African AI is how to relate, how to connect, how to engage, uh, engage uh, a technology like this one and uh, the everyday lives of people, uh, how to engage in a lively manner. Uh, in a in a bene benevolent manner, also in a protective way. So this idea of relationship uh, and relate to uh, uh, to something which is not human, like artificial intelligence, is what I am saving from 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 this webinar. From I think from all panelists uh, that we we've, we've just seen uh, how human 
uh, artificial intelligence can be uh, when it's in Africa. And it can be everywhere like that. It's not something limited to Africa. It's just an opportunity that we have to, to take. So it's offered to us and uh, generously, I would say. So thank you so much uh, uh, for all the speakers. And uh, I will uh, uh, give um, uh, last words to, uh, to Emma to close this webinar. Thank you, thank you, Sincro. So we're arriving at the end of the webinar. Sorry that we couldn't answer all the questions from uh, the audience, uh, but thank you to all the speakers, Mancha Diawara, Jennifer Cuento, Diedia, Imo de Medeiros, for your insights on, on all these topics and specifically this uh, all these questions about the community and how to deal with all these different languages. These are fascinating topics. Um, and we were delighted to host uh, this conversation. Um, I would also like to thank the um, Beaux-Arts team uh, for the organization of this event with my colleagues, Alexia Mangelangs, Raphael Monoyer, Elana uh, Antoine, and also especially Ayoko Mensa, who is a, cult a cultural expert and the programmer of the Afropolitan Festival in, uh, in Beaux-Arts. Uh, this festival will start in, on the 9th of July this year. So uh, thank you all. And before you go back to your occupations, we wanted to, show, uh, to share with you a quick survey um, that you can answer directly here on how you appreciated this webinar. Um, so please take uh, just a few minutes to, to fill it in and uh, thank you for, for attending.